as a new face, as a woman of color, as a Black woman stepping into an organization who has been around for almost 60 years and has never seen someone like me in this space in a community that is predominantly white, affluent, and, you know, having the support of board members who are like, we want to uplift your voice in this space and uplift your leadership. This is George Coster, and welcome to Voices of the Community, which explores critical issues facing Northern California communities. We introduce you to the voices of community thought leaders and changemakers working on solutions facing our fellow community members, nonprofits, small businesses, neighborhoods, cities, and our region. This episode is part of our community dialogue on the COVID-19 pandemic's impact on our arts and culture sector in the San Francisco Bay Area. We're co-producing this special series with our friends at Bayback Media. Over this special six-episode series titled The State of Our Arts and Culture Organizations, we will feature the voices of innovators, leaders, creators, workers, and funders from our arts and culture sector and the issues, solutions, and actions they are executing to stabilize, sustain, scale, and diversify our arts and culture sector. Good morning, everyone. I'm George Coster with Voices of the Community, your co-host, along with Paula Argoni from Bayvac Media. And we want to thank you for participating in our virtual live recording of the first episode of our six-part series on the state of our arts and culture organizations. Our community dialogue today focuses on board development, operations, and governance, the lens of an arts and culture nonprofit. Our guests over today's show are Michelle Mush Lee, the executive director of Youth Speaks, Julie Phillips, the artistic director and the executive director of Counterpulse, Meredith Settles, the managing director and CEO of Marin Theater Company, along with Jay Mitchell, a professor of law and the founding director of the Organizations and Transactions Clinic at Stanford Law School. Our conversation will be broken up into two parts. Our first part, I will be in conversation with Michelle, Julie, and Meredith about overall board development. And the second part will be with Paula in conversation with Jay about governance. We welcome your participation in today's conversation. There will be a Q&A session. To ask questions of our guests, please use the Q&A chat inside of Zoom, and Eric will gather questions in the background. And then on Facebook, if you're watching, please use the hashtag AskVOC. Thanks again for everyone showing up. I'm going to ask each of our guests to just give a quick background on themselves, their organization, and how long they've been working in the nonprofit arts and culture space. And Meredith, I will start with you. Hi, thank you for having me. I am the managing director and CEO, as you mentioned, of Marin Theater Company. We are in Mill Valley and we have been in existence for almost 60 years. I have joined the team just about two years ago. I moved here from New York. And so I spent many years doing theater in New York. Nothing like moving across the country in the middle of a pandemic, but the Bay Area is one of my favorite places and I couldn't have chosen a better place to move to. We are a theater that really focuses on new world development, world premieres, second run or third run productions. And we're a mid-size theater. So we have about 231 seats and it's really an exciting place. We work with wonderful playwrights and we have this year just completed a run of our new musical. We haven't done a musical in over 20 years. So very exciting place to be and excited about the next journey for MTC. And coming to you, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. My name is Michelle Mushley. I'm the executive director over at Youth Speaks. We are a nonprofit literary arts organization that's been in different parts of San Francisco, but home base's mission for 26 years. We work with young people to develop their voice around creative literacy. We provide arts education programs and public presentations for young people across the country. My background, I always like to remind folks that, yeah, I'm an executive director, but I'm a poet first. I'm a published poet. I'm an artist. That's always been my identity. I'm a mother. I'm a San Francisco native. I serve on the City of Oakland's Cultural Affairs Commission, so doing a lot of government, civic, policy-engaged work as it relates to cultural equity across the city. So my background is as an artist, but I also love a little bit of a policy wonk. In my role at Youth Speaks, trying to understand all the ways that young people have applied their stories and personal narratives. But now after 25 years, looking at the ways that young people, our alumni, are now using those same skills and applying it in business, finance, tech, government, and publishing and through the arts. So really happy to be here today. Thank you, Michelle. And Julie? Hi, Julie Phelps, Artistic and Executive Director of Counter 
Summer Pulse, which is an interdisciplinary art space located in downtown San Francisco. I've been at the helm for just about 10 years. We recently completed the purchase of our building after successfully fundraising $7 million. So that's been a huge headline for us and our community over the last year, but really just finished it at the beginning of 23. We're moving into the future with a kind of different set of expectations and opportunities for our board, actually. This has been a big time for board development and having the board really support the organization and doing something that we couldn't have done just from the staff side. Counterpulse is mid-sized just in terms of kind of scoping and understanding what we are as a business. So we have an annual operating budget of about $1.5 million on the high end. Obviously, average annual operating budgets have been swinging back and forth throughout the pandemic, but we sort of stabilize usually around one2 We have a staff of 10. If you include our event staff, it's more like 25, but really only about 15 FTE. We offer programming throughout the year, festival, residencies, co-productions, ongoing subsidized rehearsal space and free space for community members. That's us. So I'm excited for today's conversation and thank you for including me. Thank you, Julie. And Jay, coming to you, background on yourself and also the organization. Well, good morning. I'm Jay Mitchell. I'm a professor at Stanford Law School. I direct one of our teaching clinics here. Our clinics provide students with opportunities while they're in school to work with real clients on real cases and projects. My clinic focuses exclusively on nonprofit representation. We provide governance advice and documents, draft lots of contracts and MOUs, work on mergers and asset transfers, that kind of thing. This is our 16th year in business. Before joining the faculty here, I was the chief corporate counsel for Levi Strauss and Co. in San Francisco. And before the Blue Jeans business, I was a partner at a law firm up in the city. Thank you, everybody. So boards, like all aspects of organizations, evolve over time, going through ranges of strength and effectiveness. And at a high level, how would you describe where your organization's board is today? Your kind of non-scientific options are, one, developing and rebuilding, two, meeting governance and requirements, three, meeting governance requirements and elevating your organization to its highest potential, or four, other, and say why. I'm going to start with Meredith. I would say we're at a one. We are rebuilding and developing our board. Julie, how about you? Where would you say your board's at? I think it's a complicated dance between these different levels. There's some overlapping life cycles on CounterPulse's board right now. We're having a change of the guard. A lot of longtime board members who've been on the board before I even took over as director are reaching their term limits. And the completion of the capital campaign also is sort of bringing about a life cycle that some people even extended their term to sort of see through the capital campaign. So we have an outgoing old guard and an incoming. So we're definitely rebuilding and developing, but it's complicated in that a lot of the board members who are outgoing now were recruited when CounterPulse was a much smaller organization before we knew we were buying a building downtown. So there's a new influx of skills and talent in the young people who are really like coming to CounterPulse to serve what it is today. But the institutional knowledge and skill sets that the older board members are bringing are kind of, you know, I wouldn't say scramble, but like in a, a moment of handoff and leadership transition between people who really know CounterPulse well, and then new people who are coming in with like really fresh, exciting skill sets and energy. We're definitely, you know, above meeting sort of fiduciary and governance needs for the board. And particularly through the campaign, the board was really instrumental in elevating CounterPulse, like I said in my intro, above what we would have been able to achieve as just a staff. And also, you know, with bringing on new people, there's also a kind of reverse flow, a bit of staff investing in the board right now, spending time training, you know, getting people up to speed. And honestly, that's one of the things that I think makes CounterPulse's board strong is that the framework that there's a mutual flow of support. A lot of people who join CounterPulse's board, it's their first board they've ever been on. So there's this, you know, supporting CounterPulse, but CounterPulse also supporting them and developing as leaders and board members. Thank you, Julie. And coming to you, Michelle, where would you say your board's at at this point? I forgot the numbers. You'll be tested afterwards. (laughs) So one is developing and rebuilding. Two is meeting governance requirements. Three is meeting governance requirements and elevating your organization to its higher potential, everybody's goal. And then of course, four is other or all the above. It's all of the above. I inherited a number of incredible board members, but also I'm a first time ED. I'm a new ED. I'm entering my second year. I've been with the organization for 20 years. Technically I was an alumni, even though our founding executive director thought I was a teenager, but I accepted my first full-time job. I was a grown woman 
So I inherited some really strong board members who understood the organizational's mission and structure and had a strong sense of board governance. But in my first six months, I had a conversation with the board and they, I think rightfully, and I'm also grateful for this, asked, you know, what type of a board pipeline are you interested in? Are you interested in us kind of doing the traditional pipeline and and figuring out and creating a pool? Would you like to have say? That was for me, a really interesting and powerful conversation. And so I told them, look, let me see some of the board assessment work that we've done in self-reflection work and also the core competencies of our existing board member. And from there, we had a conversation about what we thought our, our gaps were on the board. So yes, we have employment law, HR folks, finance and investment folks, right? And tech folks. And one of the gaps that we named were youth development practitioners, practicing artists and or alumni and somebody or somebodies who understood that now after 26 years, we needed to be able to evolve our program to meet the demands of young people and youth culture. And so who could fit those roles? And so we brought in four new board members within my first six months. So I say all that to say the board that was there prior to my stepping into this role kind of had a lot of challenges in terms of figuring out how to navigate COVID and making sure that they were the right fiduciaries. And also they were in compliance and making sure the org was in compliance. And the new wave of folks are figuring out, number one, what does it mean to serve on a board effectively? What does it mean to serve a new and emerging leader of color in this moment at Youth Speaks? And what does it look like to lead in a way that feels less top down? So one of the last thing I'll say is we've always had a single chair. This is the first time in our history where we have now co-chairs of the board and kind of testing out what that looks like, what that distribution of work, energy, and power looks like on the board level and trying to model that for our staff and our team and us trying to learn what are the benefits and the edges of having that distributed leadership style on the board. Thank you. And Michelle, staying with you, moving on to our next question, which is oftentimes nonprofit organizations seek board members with certain backgrounds or assets, usually, you know, legal or financial skills, connections to the community or potential donors, fundraisers, but still have no experience in actually managing operations of a nonprofit, which is different than a for-profit or public sector. So how do you, and this is a question for both Meredith and Julie as well, how do you balance the need for recruiting these types of board members with the tension that comes? from their impulse to run your nonprofit like a for-profit or public sector versus a nonprofit public benefit organization. Yeah, of course. And, you know, I say this with there's a strength and there's also edges with being a new and emerging leader in the arts and culture field. So I have aspirations that are maybe not the same as somebody that's, you know, founded an organization has been around for 30, 40 years. And so one of the things that I've been thinking about with the board is how do we make sure that the culture and the ethos of the organization and the original vision for the organization is honored by and understood by people on the board. So part of that is we definitely need youth development, nonprofit administrators or executives, folks who understand this field because it's very unique. It's not tech. It's not finance. It's not even a for-profit business, you know, even though we are running a business, but we needed folks who really understood what makes youth speaks different, what makes an arts and culture organization organization that's rooted in liberatory language, that's rooted in liberatory systems to the best that we can living in this system. What does that look like in applied practice? And so we really sought out those voices. And of course, because and then this is not brown nosing, I have an amazing, amazing cadre of board members who come from the tech and business who also understand the importance of creating new spaces for emergent leaders and themselves as well. So, you know, it's great if you have a great legal background and does your leadership experience as a board member align with where you speaks is trying to grow the organization and the staff, meaning does it make sense to make room for those who may not be considered or may not have been considered in the last 20, 30 years as board leaders, because for whatever reason, maybe they've never served on a nonprofit or maybe kind of taking the usual suspects out of the equation for a little bit and exploring all the other options for board leadership. And turning to you, Meredith. Similarly, I mean, I think we are looking at it and really trying to flatten that hierarchy and it be more of a collaboration and a partnership. So I think that that's the work that we are doing. Quite frankly, most of the organization, you know, we're in a process of our artistic leadership who has been with the organization for 17 years is stepping away. Most of the folks who are employed at the organization have been here for two years and under, and our board is also reflective of that. So there are a lot of tenured board 
board members who are rolling off. So the next phase that we're moving into is really looking at it's the type of collaboration and partnership as opposed to what are the directives that the board is giving to the staff to roll out. Also, you know, representing a new phase of leadership for the organization. And what does that mean? Where we're positioned in community? What does that mean that I am now in a position of leadership at MTC? So I think what we are attempting to do is really look at ways to build trust and understanding in terms of what the expertise is that staff bring, as well as what the expertise is that board members bring and how are we working collaboratively to sustain and grow the organization. Thank you, Meredith. And Julie? I would start just to say that I don't think we have this tension. Of course, there's different skill sets around the table when you're at a board meeting of Counterpulse or, you know, working on a committee together, but that it's really catalyzed into melding of worlds more than like a tension. So I think what contributes to that for Counterpulse is we have a really clear mission and vision that our board is really behind. So keeping that center is, I think, the guiding force that brings all these different skill sets and maybe instincts around how business is done or how you reach goals into focus and like concerts them into a single effort. So I think Counterpulse recently completed a really extensive strategic plan. And then the sort of like backbone of that document is a theory of change. So it outlines who we work with, what we do with those people, what we expect to happen if we work with those people ongoing. And so we can always kind of reference back to that and it becomes a kind of translator and compass, you know, in making a decision. We also folded in dimensions to the theory of change this year, like realizing that cultural workers are actually a part of our impact. So decision making around staffing and professional development can also be seen through our impact. So even our board members in a way are the cultural workers that are outlined in our theory of change so they can see themselves as part of our impact. Like, does this invest in my professional development? Does this springboard me in my career development? So I think that's been really orienting. On a more practical level, I would say that I take maintaining the boundaries between management and governance really seriously with my board and kind of just try to never make an exception to that. Like, just be really clear, like, that's outside of your jurisdiction. That's my job. You know, that's the staff's job. That's where our artists come in or something like that. And I think those clear boundaries actually really create a respectful environment for people to collaborate then within their lane. I've never worked on a for-profit board or reported to one, so it's a bit conjecture, but I think that clear mission and vision and people join the board because they believe in the mission and vision, not because, you know, they believe in Counterpulse as a business or whatever. And then making sure that the collaboration is outlined in regards to governance and achieving our mission and vision and strategic impacts, not in terms of hiring staff or meeting financial targets, you know? It's like, of course, we do have to get down to those conversations sometimes, but I think those boundaries are helpful with board being able to lean into what their role is and serve it fully. Thank you. And Julie, staying with you, because you've talked a lot about staff and the rebuilding of your organization. Staffing inside of a nonprofit, especially a nonprofit arts organization, is pretty thin. Do you have any advice on the front of staff and administrative support and your board? Tell us what's working on that front with regards to how you and your board support your staff, but more importantly, how your staff and you support the board to go out and do the necessary work to both raise funds and be governance. Yeah, it does take a tremendous amount of staff time to manage volunteer labor. And, you know, board members are volunteers, just like people who work at your show. So you need to make sure that they have sufficient information to play their part. So there's a lot of structuring of tasks and what the goal is. But the other dimension of kind of trying to roll back some of the staff time that we put into the board is giving more and more space for them to come up with how they want to get that job done themselves, you know? So we have a gala. We need people to come to that. You can host them this way. You can host them this way. This is what the goal of the event is. This is what we're trying to do. But I've found over the years, the more I try and like get board members to do exactly what I want them to, the more I actually am just doing the job and they're not fulfilled in doing that. They don't feel like they're able to bring their true talents and capacities to the work. So I think it's a balance for Counterpulse that you have to accept that a certain amount of staff time needs to go into managing this group of people who are all volunteering to help you achieve your vision. And that it's not a one-way street in that way, going back to this mutuality where it's not just about them doing what we want them to do or getting us money or something 
something like that. It's like, there's also an investment that we're making in this group of people. And that exchange is actually what's really important and going to, you know, create the kind of momentum that a board and staff needs to be like really realizing the vision of an organization like Counterpulse. You know, like structures and committee work plans and descriptions get built and we know what the vice chair's job is. I've been trying to step back more and more and really let people manage their role at Counterpulse. These are the directors. They don't report to me. I'm not their manager. I'm not meant to, you know, to be telling them how to do what they do for Counterpulse. And it's like leadership development, maybe with staff or anybody in that case. Sometimes people need to make their own mistakes. Sometimes, you know, deadlines get missed. Oftentimes things are being done maybe in a way that I wouldn't do them. But that's the kind of opportunity and challenge of collaboration at large, you know, you have to like let it in and then meet it. So I guess just that two-way street, accepting that the investment needs to be made, but then also, you know, stepping back and letting your board do what they do. Why are they on your board if you don't trust them to be an ambassador of the organization? Very good point. And Meredith, how about you? Echoing all of that. I would also say we really invest time and in, I'm a big believer in, you know, you are here because you believe in what we do. You're volunteering and serving the organization inherent in volunteerism and service. And I've done this in other places. My background is in development and fundraising for becoming a managing director. And one of the tools that I used in that role and have since brought to this organization is creating plans with my board members, you know, really trying to get an understanding of where they see themselves fitting into the organization and where they see themselves being able to really serve. And so not trying to limit what that looks like. I have a a board sheet that you can fill out and tell me what it is you want to do, but it's not limiting. You know, this is just giving you some context of all the ways in which we operate at MTC and all the ways you can see yourself fitting in here. And so that's one way that we activate and also try to give them kind of their own ownership of how they're serving. And we also have really moved into a model where we have committees that are both board and staff. So we're working together in areas of importance for the organization. So I think even prior to pandemic, but a lot of folks had moved into having EDI or equity, diversity, inclusion, kind of task force and boards. So we definitely have that. But beyond that, you know, our facilities committee has staffers on it. Our development committee, all of those things have a representation of staff and board so that we're working collaboratively to achieve the goals of the organization. And, you know, board members are one, engaging in the work with staff members, but also getting a better understanding on both sides of what it takes to be a part of either of those factions of the organization. Thank you, Meredith. And coming to you, Michelle. So I'll say something that is for new executive directors or those who are new in management or executive leadership and nonprofit and arts and culture spaces. In an ideal world, a board should really be allies. And it's sometimes hard to see that, especially if you're new leadership and assuming a kind of positional power, especially, and I'm speaking from my positionality as a woman of color, who's always been the youngest at a table or the only Asian American woman in the arts and culture nonprofit, spoken word, youth voice spaces. It's incredibly important to assess the people on the board, their intentions. And I imagine every Everybody is there because they love the mission. So to really start by understanding that this is a unit of folks that are all your champions that champion the work. So starting from there, I know that this is a question about the tactics, but I want to commend our board during the executive transition. When they were interviewing me, they were incredibly clear about the leadership that they wanted. So for me, communicating exactly what it is that Youth Speaks is seeking in a leader And from the top, I was very clear with them. This is the type of leader that I am. They're looking for vision. They're looking for strategic change. I told them I'm big on collaboration and information. So we sent out a board assessment. Kind of we do this thing at Youth Speaks called Life is Primary Text, which is we start with the interests and the knowledge of where you're at. Just like as Meredith was saying, what is it that you really, really love? First of all, let's start there. Some people are intimidated. Like I can't raise $50,000 for a board. I can't pledge $5,000. And I work, I'm a single parent, but I want to serve and I love what y'all do and I'll do my best. And so we don't want to eliminate folks who can give in a way beyond deep pockets or financial means, right? I think Julie also alluded to this, but asking the board, just as we would any constituent, any stakeholder, what is it that you're most excited about? Where are your strengths? But also asking them, where do you think that you would want us to be able to support and learn in your own board journey? And so maybe taking somebody who's had an experience in youth development work and putting them in the investment committee, just as a co-space, 
Another thing that, you know, we asked the board, what is it that we need? We have a big 800 person event coming up. What what do you need in order to engage, in order to get your network of friends and, and family in the space? They say, we just need really clear information. That's always the ask. And so one of the strategies that we have is we started something called Vibe Check which is an internal communication strategy just for our board. It's very simple. It's short. It's not a long newsletter, but it's high level, all the most important stuff and cut and paste templates, social media kits. I can't tell you the number of times, you know, here's the fundraising statistics. Here's what goal to gap so far. Here are the highlights. We have a board member that we highlight every month. You know, we want to incentivize and give board love too. I think the board is often like viewed as the scary people behind the curtains that are doing the work or maybe overseeing or assessing. Everyone's scared of the board. We also want to humanize board and, you know, uplift them. So we like to celebrate a board member that's either volunteering at an event or has done something creative in their own artistic life and celebrate them there. And then also we are a very young organization, meaning our staff is young. BIPOC. I'm the oldest. I'm 40 years old. I'm not the oldest. I'm just about the oldest, but we have Gen Z staff, meaning what does it look like to have a board that's responsive to young professionals of color? So last thing, I just want to share for anybody listening. Okay, well, what does it look like to structure the board and committees or subcommittees? We have five committees. One is a program strategic innovation committee, which is just about looking to the next 25 years. How do we evolve an organization that's been around for as long as you speaks? We have governance, we have investment, we have finance, of course, but the PSI committee and the development committee are really two places where our staff lead and engage the board. And I'm going to tell you this right now. If your board is not excited, enthused, and kind of refreshed by being in direct conversation with your staff, I would encourage we all reassess everything. And that is the strongest strategy for me as an executive director is to put them in direct conversation where appropriate with those who are on the front lines of the work who can speak to the magic that we all know is true with arts and culture. And again, arts and culture, people often get, you know, oh, you guys feel good. There's a lot of great feelings, but what are the hard numbers? Our board was like, hey, we know you speaks is incredible. You do incredible live performances. What are the stats? Arm us with five stats that we need to know to be able to make a case to invite colleagues. How many young people are you serving? What's the audience survey response rate? How are young people connecting or how are their mental health kind of metrics improving as a result of being in conversation or direct spaces that you speak? Hold? And so we started collecting all of that information this year to be able to give them hard numbers as well, because, you know, not everyone is going to have the luxury of 30 minutes to learn about youth speaks, but they were very clear about the things that they needed. And then having a staff that isn't afraid to deliver because they understand the larger picture. Yes, feel good is amazing. And the board needs very concise, straight to the point data points sometimes in order to help us advance the work, whether it's on the fundraising or making new friends out in the world that we don't have in social circles that we may or may not have access to. Thank you, Michelle. That was a great response. I think you've got an A and I'm hitting all four questions there. I'm trying to be an A student. This is often what happens to new executive directors. We strive hard. We go, we try to legitimize our, no, I'm just joking, but I will just say that this is a very, very hard thing for new leadership, right? Board management. That was one of the questions that I was asked by somebody who governed, who was the chair of our governance said, Hey, what's your experience with governing and managing a board? And I said, none. And that was a steep, steep learning curve. And so I think for new leaders, it's easy to fall into the a mindset of the board is scary. They're judging me. I have to perform. And I think we do ourselves a disservice as leaders by saying, I need help. I think that is the biggest key to say, I need your help in this area because I either don't know or I'm afraid or I just need somebody to think this out and coach me through this. So, you know, I want to encourage all new leaders out there. The board is really supposed to be there to support you, to be almost a mentor for GS. I know that that's kind of legally a little crazy. You don't want to be friends with your board members. I think Jay's probably going to speak to that in a little bit, but they're supposed to be for us. What do they need? They need things just as much as we do in order to be able to do the job that we're all at the table to try to accomplish. Thank you. So over this last three years, we've obviously had the pandemic. We had George Floyd in our racial reckoning across the country. We had literally in this space of performing arts, 90 plus percent unemployment for over a year with folks. Everyone has been struggling to come back to try to retain the same audiences and grow audiences and stay alive. So I would love it if each of you can kind of share one aspect of navigating the pandemic and what was particularly hard for you and your organization and what your board provided you in the way of strategic support, you know, share favorite story, et cetera. So Meredith, let's go to you. 
Yeah, I think to Michelle's point about really developing kind of those trust relationships with your board and acknowledging that we're all, I mean, the pandemic threw everyone into a loop. None of us knew what we were doing. So, uh, we didn't know how to move forward, particularly in theater. I mean, it shut down our business. And so, you know, I think the ways in which our board really stepped up was to guide us through some of those larger practices. You know, we were severely reduced staffed, still are, but they really supported us through the PPP process, the SVOG, all of those kind of larger government applications, all of those things kind of supported us through that process. Also as a younger, newer staff, meaning, you know, some younger in age, but mostly a newer staff at the theater. So I think that was in large part, they supported us through. The other thing, really, quite frankly, while we want to have the belief in the board members who are truly here collaborating in partnerships, they also have been really supportive in the fact that when it's time to have those hard conversations with board members who are not aligning with the direction of the way the organization is moving and being okay to say that this might be the time where, you know, you've done really great work, you've served the organization in this really wonderful way, and now is the time to transition into something new that might be more aligned with where you are as an individual, because the organization is moving in this direction and you're not aligned in that way. And I think that as a new face, as a woman of color, as a Black woman stepping into an organization who has been around for almost 60 years and has never seen someone like me in this space, in a community that is predominantly white, affluent, and, you know, having the support of board members who are like, we want to uplift your voice in this space and uplift your leadership. And so that has been really helpful coming out of the pandemic in this space of racial reckoning, really acknowledging that this is new and we're all here to support whatever this next process is and we're collaborating in that next move. So I think that's really been the most helpful and, you know, really shifting the way in which MTC is operating. Thank you, Meredith. Great insights. And Julie, coming to you. I would say that the single greatest dimension of board support during the pandemic was trusting and stepping back and letting the staff have a lot of range to do things completely off the map of our program templates and models and usual execution strategies for our mission. We also, you know, mostly do live arts. So there was a real need to experiment and prototype and pilot. And we really committed from the very beginning of the pandemic of not ceasing operations completely. So of course, we had the moments where our building were boarded up and things like that. But we quickly turned to doing performances in parks and some of them, you know, just like Renegade, just doing it. Okay, well, if you don't have amplified sound, it's just people in a park, you know. In May of 2020, we shifted and did our gala completely online as a Zoom meeting. And we hired a bunch of dancers who we had already committed to paying that year, but then had to cancel all of their productions to go and be like contemporary dancing telegrams and delivering food to our board and donors and we had this weird zoom call and so the board just being like yeah that sounds good like your skill set in this moment is being somebody who designs arts and culture programming and engages artists in communities and letting me and my staff really just have range to do that without a lot of red tape i can't even imagine what it might be like to be with a board who's like oh you want to roll out a new type of program well i'm going to need to see a whole write up you know especially in the pandemic it was already so stifling there was so many hurdles to jump already so that trust was really important and continuing themselves to engage in the organization, despite all of our programming, maybe not being what they recognize or what they signed up to support, you know, just in light of the generalized anxiety and meltdown of the world, you know, it's not like people all of a sudden just all fell off the side of the ship and no one was on my board anymore, which in a way I could have seen that happening. You know, you're a volunteer. It's really confusing right now. There's so many things you're juggling. So just that commitment, just staying with it. I mean, we did see some life cycle stuff during the pandemic, of course, but just quickly moving to having board meetings online and this just sort of agility, adaptation, trust. And thankfully, I actually am part of an ED circle that helped me navigate some of them like PPP grants none of us have ever seen before that all need to be written right now. And then you can't even submit it. So those logistics were more on the management side. But you know, when and where board members had to upload driver's license because I'm out of town, a lot of rolling up the sleeves and working in ways that were really different than pre pandemic, you know, which had kind of moved away from the board working as much maybe. And so there was a lot more short order things, asking people to show up and volunteer in parks and things like that. 
Yeah, I think the pandemic galvanized the board in a lot of ways. Virtual meetings, I actually think, really helped with workflow with the board. I think it makes it easier for the committees to get together and for me to have strategic conversations with small groups or the whole board calling special meetings. All of that was made so much easier by virtual meeting. I think it actually can't be underestimated in terms of what it looks like to serve on a board right now. So we have meetings in person again now at Counterpulse, and I think it's really important for people to come to counterpulse as a board member just in terms of the facility being a big part of the asset that we have and are to our community but we're never going to go back to always meeting in person and I think the adaptability has actually really galvanized the board in the pandemic I think a real level of strategic kind of working together was forged and that being kind of underwritten by this like trust and knowing when it's kind of time to step back and just like be wind at someone's back and they did a really great job of that. You're listening to Voices of the Community, which explores critical issues facing Northern California communities. Voices of the Community is supported by a grant from the Zellerbach Family Foundation, whose arts and culture grants ensure vibrant work is created, new voices are celebrated, and artists and audiences inclusive of the Bay Area's diverse communities and cultures have opportunities to thrive. Find out more at zff.org. This is George Coster, your co-host, with Paula Aragoni. And if you're just joining us, today's episode is part of our community dialogue on the COVID-19 pandemic's impact on our arts and culture sector in the San Francisco Bay Area. Let's get back to our conversation about the issues and best practices of both board development and governance for nonprofit organizations with Michelle Mush Lee, the Executive Director of Youth Speaks, Julie Phillips, the Artistic Director and the Executive Director of Counterpulse, Meredith Settles, the Managing Director and CEO of Marin Theatre Company, along with Jay Mitchell, a Professor of Law and the Founding Director of the Organizations and Transactions Clinic at Stanford Law School. Thank you, Julie. I'm going to have Paula speak with Jay about governance, and then we'll do QA at the end. Thanks, everybody. A good way to talk about governance is also just to share how, as an executive director at Bayback Media, I realized that we really needed some help. So I started in the role of ED about four years ago. And in the beginning of 2019, my organization was going through a lot of transition in leadership. We had had a long-term executive director who was wonderful that had been in the role for 10 years and had decided to move along. And then our board actually had a lot of issues of finding the next ED. So by the time I came in 2019, things were pretty dire, honestly. (laughs) So my role was really about stabilization and working with our team and our board to get things back into the right shape. I say all that just to share that between 2019 being a strengthening year and then what happened from 2020 and through now (laughs) with COVID, we were working on so many things just to get our programs to be excellent and to be stable and to take care of our staff and also bringing in in a whole lot of new board members because pre-2019 people were really tired. They had gone through a lot of work of trying to do, you know, executive transition work. And so a lot of people were ready to kind of roll off. And so we just didn't have the time and energy to put a lot of work into their governance. So that was why when I was introduced today, I was so excited because I felt like we really needed the support. And frankly, a lot of our documents and practices hadn't been updated since I think the 1980s, Jay, if I'm remembering. <laughs> so So that is my segue into our conversation, Jay. Maybe you can start us off just by talking a little bit about when we say governance and documents and practices, what does that encompass? So let's talk about the exciting topic of legal documents. If you think about governance documents, I think they fall into about half a dozen buckets. One are the Articles of Incorporation. That's the document that's created at the very beginning. It literally creates the legal entity as filed with the state. Generally, you don't have to mess around with it much once you're underway. The second are the bylaws. Quite familiar to folks, they largely deal with board matters, the size, elections, term length, term limits, meetings, voting, committees, officers, that basic structure, that basic framework for governance. For board committees, folks often have charters or descriptions that set out the responsibilities of the committees and often address their composition as well. There are a set of core policy 
agencies that the IRS cares about, asks about them on Form 990, the conflict of interest policy, of course, but also whistleblower policies and retaliation protections for your employees, document retention, executive compensation review. There are documents that are associated with board meetings, for example, the minutes of the meeting and sometimes formal board resolutions. And then finally, a couple of things that we've touched on already, sort of orientation materials at the front end when a new director joins the board, and then some kind of board self-assessment instrument for a board to just check on how it's doing, learn from that, and improve over time. Those are not legal, but I think they are really quite important in terms of the overall governance operations of the entity. That's great. Thank you, Jay. So related to that, if an organization doesn't have tons of resources to do a full overhaul, where do you recommend they get started? Yeah, you know, I think when we worked with you and when we work with our clients, we tend to do a full overhaul because really coming at it holistically, I think, is the way to go. Oftentimes, documents will become inconsistent over time. They're prepared by various people. And I think every now and then it makes sense to invest in a full look. When you can't do that, I'd pay attention to a couple things. I'd certainly pay attention to the bylaws. That's really kind of a legal foundation. Want to make sure it actually reflects what you do. And it's worth just checking to see if they're up to date with current law because the law does change and certainly best practices change over time. The other legal document to pay close attention to is the conflict of interest policy. That's quite important for state law purposes, quite important for IRS purposes. The concern, of course, is insiders taking advantage of their position. If that happens, you could get in trouble. I'd want to make those two at the top of the list. And then outside of that, I think I would focus on orientation materials. Those really are quite important to get somebody off on the right foot when they join the board. I also think they can provide useful refreshers for directors who've been there for a while. And I think investing there makes good sense for most folks. That's great. I think another thing that has been touched on by a few of the panelists so far is just that issue of like, how do you make that nice blend of bringing in folks from other industries that don't really have the nonprofit experience? A lot of times, I know in our sector, but I think across the board in nonprofits, we have board members and it's their first time. And that's really exciting because you get this new freshness and energy and excitement. I'm forgetting your direct quote, Mush, but there was something about refreshment and energy that I wrote down that I'm going to take with me. But I think that's definitely an asset. But then also it does get to that point of education. And I know that's something that you really care about. Do you want to say a few more words about where you think we should focus our efforts on education? I think about that in two respects. One is, I think it's important just to help somebody establish the basic fact base, you know, learning about the organization's programs and key activities, having an understanding of the basic numbers. You don't have to understand all the financial statement footnotes and all that, but understanding the revenue mix and any dependencies, understanding key spending categories, understanding sort of the operational metrics that you use for figuring out whether you're doing a good job or not. Michelle was talking about that earlier. Just those basic numbers. So when they get the report before the board meeting from the ED. They can see what's going on. They can see if there are trends. They can see if there's things that they ought to be paying particular attention to. The other is understanding the board's role. And we have touched on that earlier in two respects. One, staying in your lane. It's not day-to-day management, but management manage. And the other is getting a handle on the general contours of fiduciary duty. The duty of care, which in practical terms means learning, showing up, being engaged, paying attention, asking questions, and the duty of loyalty, which means always putting the interest of the organization first, not one's personal interest. I think just understanding those two basic things, you got to do your homework, you got to pay attention, you really got to focus on what's in the best interest of the organization is just super important to establish that baseline knowledge at the front end. And then the other one, and you all know a whole lot more about this than me, is kind of the social inclusion side of people getting to know each other a little bit, building some rapport gaining some sense of collegiality and learning how to work with one another. That just seems important to me on multiple levels. And that doesn't come from some PowerPoint deck that you get on day one, you know? Definitely. Or looking through our bylaws. Looking through the bylaws. Yeah. They're good bylaws, but they don't do that. <laughs> 
Okay. Well, speaking of bylaws a little more, can you talk to us about just what is a governance committee? What are the roles and responsibilities? And furthermore, within the state of California, can you talk to us about what are committees that are required and which ones are optional, please? So starting with governance, governance committees typically have sort of four core responsibilities. One, they assess the composition of the board. They look for gaps, they look for needs, and make recommendations to the board. Second, they have the lead on recruiting and nominating director candidates, sort of seeking folks out, vetting them, checking on their interest, bringing them forward. The third is overseeing all the legal docs, the bylaws, the committee charters, the policies, updating them as appropriate. And fourth is overseeing orientation programs, self-assessment programs, board education programs, that kind of thing. Governance committees also sometimes have a role in identifying candidates candidates for officer positions, identifying candidates for committee chairs, making recommendations for committee appointments. When you combine that with director recruiting, the governance committee can play quite an important role from a DEI and board culture point of view. Other committees, you know, there's only one committee that's required, and that's the audit committee. And that's only if a nonprofit has $2 million or more in non-government revenue. So if you're under $2 million in non non-government revenue, there's no requirement under the California Nonprofit Integrity Act to have an audit committee. Certainly the best practice folks like audit committees for obvious reasons, but it's not mandated under state law unless you're at 2 million plus in non-government sources. The other committees that are super common, you know, finance, development, governance, as we heard earlier, executive committees are pretty common, especially if the organization has a large board or just has rather few meetings each year. Having a body that can take decisions on behalf of the board between board meetings is a good thing, particularly if you've got some giant, you know, 40-person board or something like that. The other one, and we heard about that earlier, is committees that are unique to an organization. Some aspect of the nonprofit's activities that are especially important. It could be programs, it could be risk management, it could be whatever, but we've seen a fair amount of that, and I think that approach makes good sense. The other thing I'd say about committees is And again, you all know this a lot better than me. You don't want to have too many. You know, it's a lot of work for staff to support a committee. And obviously, you want to respect your board meetings and our board members' time. We've got a couple clients coming in this spring, and both of them have close to 10 committees apiece. And we're going to ask them about that. But I think those core ones, and particularly if there's some that are really focused on something unique to the organization, I think think that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. That's great. And actually, I think that the requirement for an audit committee, I think, would come as a surprise for a lot of organizations. So that's great information. The other thing on the audit committee, I'll just point it out, is the state mandates specific responsibilities for audit committees. So you may have one, but it may not be doing the right thing. So one of those things, if you're in that 2 million plus category, is just making sure that your audit committee is carrying out the responsibilities that are set out in the statute. And that ought to be reflected in the charter or other description for that committee. Okay, great to know. So switching gears just a little bit, I was at a lunch recently with a group of amazing women CEOs of nonprofits. And one of the topics that came up that was kind of juicy was just this idea of whether CEOs should be board members, non-voting, voting members. There were a lot of different perspectives. So can you share a little bit, what are best practices from your perspective, Jay, and what are the implications? So it's funny, the nonprofit world generally comes at the question of CEOs on the board completely opposite from the corporate world. You look at most companies, businesses, and the CEO is on the board. You look at most nonprofits and the CEO is not on the board. Based on board source survey data and other sources like that, a fairly small percentage of nonprofits have their EDs, have their CEOs on the board. And the theory, of course, is that the CEOs report to the board. You know, there's tension there. There's a blurring of the line between over oversight and execution. There's the potential for conflicts. My view is that, you know, organizations should do what's right for them in terms of both leadership structure and recruiting the right leader. But the best practice guidance certainly doesn't recommend having the senior executive on the board. I personally don't favor that. I just think having the roles a little bit cleaner makes a whole lot of sense in the nonprofit setting. 
makes sense. And I think that one of the tensions that I've heard, particularly for smaller organizations, is more when a nonprofit board has a lot of closed door executive sessions and might be making strategic decisions outside of being in conversation with an executive director, yeah. which can feel like incredibly undermining. So definitely a good hot button kind of conversation. <laughs> so another area though, that sometimes can be confusing, I know for boards is this notion of an ex officio. Can you define what does that mean for a board, Jay? Yeah. And that's related to what we just talked about. There is a lot of confusion about the term ex officio. I think we tend to think of it in sort of meaning that ex officio means like unofficial or non-voting or something like that, right? Ex officio member of that committee, they go to the meetings, but they don't vote. As a technical matter, that's not correct. For legal purposes, what ex officio means is by reason of a position. It doesn't mean non-voting. So for example, and if we go back to just what we talked about, if the bylaws say the CEO is always on the board, we'd say the CEO is an ex officio member of the board by reason of their holding that job. California, a couple of years ago, even amended the statute on this. It now says if you don't have a vote, you are not a director and you are not a member of the board. There's no such concept as a non-voting member of the board. It just doesn't exist. If you don't vote, you're not a director and you probably shouldn't be held out as one. The thing to know about all of this is that boards and committees can invite anyone they want to attend and participate. You know, we put right in the bylaws that the ED attends meetings unless the board goes into executive session. We don't call the ED a non-voting director, but we say they go and participate. And that is just to reflect the fact that California says there's no such thing as a non-voting member of the board. We want to respect that, but also make it clear that the ED ought to be at the table, except in what we hope the uncommon instance of boards going into executive session and talking about stuff behind the ED's back. Okay. That makes sense. This is a confusing topic. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to replay this so I can <laughs> make sure I understand all of it because it is. And I've also heard it on boards that I serve on. I feel like there is kind of ongoing confusion in this area. Yeah. Another kind of juicy topic is definitely on how boards can support the managing of conflicts of interest. And I think in the arts and culture sector, one of the beautiful things is that a lot of our people are also artists, right? Like Mush said earlier. So we have people that are artists, supporters, they might be producers, all those kinds of things. So the importance of clarity is huge in terms of trying to define those relationships. Can you give us some tools and things to think about? That's a great question. I think with a conflicts policy, one thing you want to do for sure is just make sure it covers the basics, right? So there's full disclosure of conflicts, there's independent review, there's confirmation that whatever the deal is, it's fair, that you document that review in the minutes. Those are the basics. That's driven by state law. That's driven by the IRS. For situations like you're describing, kind of these recurring situations, I think it's best just to deal with them head on in the conflict conflicts policy. Just set out how you're going to handle it, whether it's seeking grants or renting a venue or whatever. I just think there's a lot to be said for hitting the nail on the head and acknowledging that these relationships exist, making clear that disclosure is expected, making clear that there aren't any special deals, making clear that directors are not to exert undue influence on the staff. To me, that's the best way to handle it, to acknowledge it, to say it's great, but also to make sure that uh, you know, you're jumping through the hoops properly. If you do rent a venue to a member of your board or something like that, you can do it. But rather than try and interpret some legalistic general conflicts policy, I would just acknowledge the situation and say, this is what we're going to do. Thank you. And in closing of this section, Jay, just any other kind of recurring themes that you've seen in your work? You've worked yeah. with so many different nonprofits. What are kind of the things that happen most often? There's a couple. Another one is kind of like the ex officio business, and that is what the heck is an officer? You always hear the term board officers. And as it turns out, there's no such thing as a board officer. Officers are officers of the corporation, not the board. And as such, 
there's no requirement that only directors can be officers. We think it makes a ton of sense for the ED to be a corporate officer as well as an employee, to make it crystal clear, you know, who's the boss, who's the chief executive, and enabling the ED to sign documents in the capacity of a corporate officer, which is a useful thing when you're dealing with the state or dealing with a bank or something like that. So that's one thing we see all the time. Don't all the officers have to be directors? No, they don't. And in fact, at least for one employee, we think it makes sense for the ED to be a, a corporate officer. The other one is that we tend to see people put a lot of detail in the bylaws. A common example is they have a problem today with a director and they put something in the bylaws about it. And that sort of enshrines a permanent rule. And that gets dated. It's not followed in practice. It's kind of hard to keep track of things if you're always fooling around with the bylaws and amending them every six months. I think it's useful to think about the bylaws as kind of a higher level document, almost a constitution. And to the extent that you need to deal with more granular situations or more practical things, go with guidelines and policies because they're just a little bit easier to change and easier to keep track of. I'm not a big fan of encyclopedic bylaws that cover every imaginable thing. I just think it's easier to keep them at a fairly high level and deal with the more granular stuff in something that's a bit more flexible than a fancy legal document like a set of bylaws. That makes a lot of sense. Those were all of my questions, but I was thinking we have this amazing panel here. Julie, Meredith, Mush, I don't know if you have a question that you want to ask Jay while we have Jay. This is like law school getting a <laughs> call from a professor. You don't know what's coming, you know? Thanks. Yeah, exactly. Get ready, Jay. <laughs> Okay, well, while you're thinking of a, a question, possibly, what do you think, George? I would like to, since we have no questions from the audience, or even Jay, you've obviously, it was an amazing professorial act there. No <laughs> questions from the class. So what I'd like to do is, since we're going to the third year of the pandemic and coming into a new arts and culture season, if you will, is ask each of the panelists, what would you and your board like to do? Or what are one or two things you'd like to accomplish over this next year with your board and organization? And how will you and your staff support the board to get there? Let's start with Meredith. MTC started off as a community theater. And so one of the things that we have really been focused on is how do we get back to our roots? How are we really serving in community? So there are a couple of ways that we're working to do that. A lot of collaborations that we're working through and, you know, intersectional with other kind of arts and culture organizations across the county working with them to promote mutual work. But also one of the things that we kind of talked about is how do we kind of just socialize with one another and outside of the work that we're doing, but also be in service to communities. So some of the things that we are planning and have done in kind of pilot ways this season, what we're looking to do is really engage with community. So doing service projects as board, as staff, as families in our community that do not necessarily, you know, have to do with the actual theater that we're producing or the programs that we are doing as MTC, but really being in service to the community through serving at our local food bank or preparing meals and all of those type of things that really take us outside of the work, but we're working in service to our community together. And so creating those type of bonds and partnerships. Thank you, Meredith. And Michelle? Now we're very much in a digital era. We have board members that are all across the country. And so one of the things, you know, I'm sure every ED will hear this, which is how do you get your board to be a more fundraising board? <laughs> and that's annoying and I get it. But right now on the board, we're trying to figure out what does it mean to be an active fundraising body and a strong fundraising body and not have that standard set externally. And so right now, part of the work is working with our board members that are in DC and on the East Coast to host very small kind of, you know this, Paula, what we used to call Jeffersonian dinners, but for 2023, which is a small group of folks, maybe potential new and emerging funders or philanthropists cultivating the next generation of donors, but also working with board folks that are on the East Coast to host small dinners in their home to get them engaged with the organization. I think the second thing that we're doing is I'm very excited about this, which is specifically with a committee that I mentioned 
mentioned the PSI committee, which is if your organization is at a crossroads and you're thinking, how do we evolve? How do we change? How do we decide what programs to sunset and what to sunrise? I would say you like that sunset and sunrise, even as I was saying, I was like, that was a very executive director thing to say. We are working with a small group of committed folks on the board that are a collection of nonprofit folks, but also those who have expertise in a field called narrative strategy to support me and thought partnership to figure out what does organizational effectiveness look like and how do we transform our programs to create a new department at Speaks that that's never existed, but also to ensure that there is integrity in a pipeline that exists from our core programs as we kind of go through this change and what does change management look like. So on the programmatic front, that's what we're doing with our board. And on the fundraising front, really trying to expand our notion of what a philanthropist looks like and how philanthropy and fundraising can happen in this era. Thank you, Michelle. And Julie, how about you? Counter Pulse's neighborhood has gone under a tremendous transformation during the last few years with a lot of the people who work and visit the neighborhood not returning. It's obviously a big story with the mid-market of San Francisco. I don't have my head wrapped around it yet. It's quite a complex issue, but I think that that will be something that I'll look to the board for partnership and support on is reconnecting to the business community, you know, figuring out how as a now land holder in the neighborhood, we serve our community in a geographic scope and sense, which is, you know, continuing to come into focus for Counterpulse, where mostly in the past we've been discipline or community focused, and that doesn't necessarily link to the geographies of your city and the kind of role of being a business owner and in the business community. So I think that the board members will have a lot to add to that conversation for me. And, you know, I just hope we can be a positive force for our neighborhood beyond just doing what Counterpulse does for who we do it for. And I think discovering that through the board members who are around the table now, but also in recruiting and connecting to leaders in the neighborhood through joining as board members and committee members and things like that. It's a time of evaluation for Counterpulse also. So we put forward our new strategic plan and theory of change in 21, and it's a five-year plan. So we've been in a process of surveying and evaluating and understanding our impact through the lens of this new plan that we have. And we've brought on some board members recently who I'm excited to help tell Counterpulse's story of impact as we move out of the kind of strategic communication around the capital campaign and buying the building. We're looking more to really understand and be able to to story tell about how we impact the communities that we touch. I also am excited for redeveloping pathways and connections globally, sort of another geographic consideration, but this one about reaching out really suffered during the pandemic, you know, people not able to actually move around and also partners in other countries closing and shuttering and all this needs to be kind of sorted and sort of reweaved and the mobility of board meetings to go virtually. I'm excited to recruit board members who aren't actually living locally in the Bay Area. We don't yet have that on our board. We are still all a local group living and coming to board meetings and programming in person. But I think that there's an opportunity there and that the virtual meeting enables it, but the actual need presented kind of coming out of the pandemic is really crucial. The pathways that our artists have to work professionally have always, in my opinion, involved working non-locally, touring to LA, spending summers dancing in Europe, whatever the case is may be. So rebuilding like just grassroots emergent side of the way those networks work through just visiting and traveling and connecting and recruiting board members in this case, but also taking the opportunity and responding to the need to also maybe formalize some of those pathways a little bit more than they've been in the past because they aren't maybe going to happen as naturally right now. So I think that's the horizon for Counterpulse's board. Thank you, Julie. Can I add one thing here on this point, even though I'm not an ED? Go for it. We undertook a project last year for Dance USA, which is the national dance organization, to really think hard about lessons from the pandemic for the relationship between performers and venues and thinking about what we can do with the contractual terms and engagement agreements to be fairer, to structure compensation in a way that reflects the risks that, say, a dance company takes on when it's preparing for a performance or for a tour, to think a little bit differently about the cancellation terms, to think about a sensible way to handle digital presentation. And there's a lot to learn from how so many artists got crushed during the pandemic. What can we do coming out to learn from that and how we set up contractual relationships between presenters and artists? I'm a lawyer, so I talk about contracts, right? I 
think there are some things along those lines that could be really quite beneficial to the arts community that we ought to take advantage of this moment to put into place. Wonderful. And actually, there was a one question from Annette, Jay, that was for you. And Annette was interested on your thoughts on an idealized process for identifying and recruiting new board members. In other words, who to try to vet and recruit and also an ideal or non-ideal board size from all of your experience. Boy, board size is really hard to say. It can't be tiny, can't be gigantic, but it's really difficult, I think, to generalize about that. Board source has some guidance on that kind of thing, but it's difficult to generalize. In terms of recruiting, I mean, obviously taking advantage of the networks of current directors and staff and funders and the rest, but I also think it's super important to look outside of traditional channels for all sorts of reasons, for new ideas, for bringing diversity to the board, not just stick Sticking to the known channels, who knows who, but stepping back and thinking a little bit more creatively about organizations or schools or other places where you might be able to learn about some really intriguing candidates to consider inviting to the board. That to me is the big thing. Don't just look in the usual places, but think about other places to look. Great insights. We're going to wrap up here and I'm going to ask each of our remaining guests, Meredith and Julie, to please share with the audience how folks who are listening and watching the show support your organization's and if you have any upcoming events that people can participate in. So Meredith, let's start with you. Yes, you can find us at pretty much any social media platform at Marin Theater Co. And you can also find our website, www.marintheater.org. And we just closed our most recent production, which was Justice, a new musical. We will be going into performances for our next production starting May 4th. And that will be Where Did We Sit on the Bus, which is a tour de force of one person show. The individual is really just is their own force of music, the performance, and we will be performing that starting May 4th. We go into performances. So you can find information on our social media pages as well as on our website. And Julie? Yeah, we can be found at, at Counterpulse on most social media platforms. The website is counterpulse.org. And our gala is also on May 6th. So that's a really fun sort of space themed party that you can come to and support Counterpulse directly. And if you want to support Counterpulse or get to know more about what we do, you can also just email me, Julie at counterpulse.org. Thank you so much for having me today and giving us the opportunity to have these conversations. I really feel educated and tied in. That's a good feeling these days. Thank you, Julie. We want to thank our guest. We really appreciate you sharing all of your wonderful insights into board development and governance. And we'll make sure all of our listeners and viewers have all of your contact information, how they can support you as well. Thank you all for participating in our show today. And please look out for our next episode of this ongoing series. That's it for this episode of Voices of the Community. You've been listening to the voices of Michelle Mush Lee, the Executive Director of Youth Speaks, Julie Phillips, the Artistic Director and the Executive Director of Counterpulse, Meredith Settles, the Manager and Director and CEO of Marin Theatre Company, along with Jay Mitchell, a Professor of Law and the Founding Director of the Organizations and Transactions Clinic at Stanford Law School, and my co-host, Paula Argoni from Bayback Media. To find out more information about our guests and their respective organizations, programs, services, how to volunteer, and making a donation, please visit their websites. For Youth Speaks, go to youthspeaks.org. For Counterpulse, go to counterpulse.org. For Marin Theater, go to marintheater.org. And for the Organizations and Transactions Clinic at Stanford Law School, go to law.stanford.edu. We hope that you enjoyed Episode 1 of our new six-part series highlighting the issues and solutions of our arts and culture organizations and their workforce as they innovate to come back from the pandemic along with addressing the systemic racism in our performing arts ecosystem. We welcome your participation in our next virtual and live in-person community dialogue event that will be focused on audience development through exploring new and different business models that have come out of the pandemic. Our next community dialogue will be streamed, as well as you can tune in to our usual radio show, podcast, and television show with our friends at Bayback Media. Go to georgecoster.com and sign up for our newsletter to participate in both the live, virtual, and in-person shows and stay in the loop on our new series. 
To find out more and get engaged with the organizations and guests featured in the series, please go to my website, georgecoster.com, and click on Voices of the Community to find links to the extended versions of these interviews and to listen to the entire series. After listening to these stories, we hope that you will consider making a donation and volunteering to support our arts and culture organizations, performers, and workforce. Today's episode was made possible by the Audio and Video Wizard and our associate producer, Eric Estrada, and the graphics magic of Casey Nads from Citron Studios, as well as our co-host, Paula Aragoni, from Bayback Media, along with the wonderful crews at Bayback Media, KSFPLPFM, KPCA LPFM and Petaluma Community TV. Voices of the Community is supported by a grant from the Zellerbach Family Foundation, whose arts and culture grants ensure vibrant work is created, new voices are celebrated, and artists and audiences inclusive of the Bay Area's diverse communities and cultures have opportunities to thrive. Find out more at zff.org. Take us along your next walk, workout, or drive by subscribing to Voices of the Community on Apple Podcast, Spotify, and Google Podcast, or wherever you get your podcast. You can follow us on Twitter, at George Coster, and we'd love to hear from you with feedback and show ideas. So send us an email to george at georgecoster.com. I'm George Coster in San Francisco, and thank you for listening.